Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, what we'll do is we'll just to get to know who folks are in the room. What I thought we could first do is uh, put up our first poll question, if we can do just to understand who's on our webinar today with us, because obviously there's a lot of people working uh, in the system uh, and uh, working with seniors in different ways. So if you want to take about 30 seconds and if you could please indicate if you're from the area of primary care, home and community care, long-term care, or the hospital sector, or public health, or another group. Perfect. And so what we see from our first results are most folks, about half of our folks are from the hospital sector, but we have a nice range of folks who are from the long-term care, home and community care, a few folks from the primary care sector and public health. And for those who are saying other, it'd be great if you just want to take a moment in the chat box and maybe you can mention where you're from um, or what are the other, how do you identify yourselves as others? So that way we understand a little bit more about any other different sectors that are involved. So we've got some folks from other LINs, which is great. Obviously remembering the RGP network is not just local, but actually across the province. Okay, so we'll get to know who you are as we move through, but what we'll do is we'll start the presentation and we'll go to the next slide. Perfect, so the purpose of today's presentation and discussion is to, um, is to look to provide some context around issues of aging in Toronto and Ontario, um, and we'll certainly um, also provide an overview of the emerging Toronto Seniors, uh, Toronto Central Lynn Seniors Plan, and including a specific focus on dementia. We'll also talk about some of the outlined proposed work, metrics and enablers for 2018 and 2019. And the purpose really of today is to really begin a dialogue on how we can collaborate and align this plan with other related activities. And we have a case study of uh, a TC Lynn client and a circle of care, and then identify other opportunities and uh, enablers as well. We'll go to the next slide. So right now, if you look at kind of the issues, everybody on this call probably knows that we're an aging population. These are just some of the stats that we have that are specific to the Toronto Central Lynn. And it just reminds us that while Toronto is actually a young city, when you look at our Lynn in particular, 13.1% of the population are 65 and older. That's compared to the provincial um, average of around 16.9%. So we certainly are younger than the average population, but for many of those of you who are based here in Toronto Central um, and, and the GTA, you know that we are dealing with more and more older people every year. And you see just in the bottom left-hand corner there, you see that how significantly, just within a five-year period, our populations 65 and older are growing um, and, uh, and, and will continue to grow. And overall, when you actually look at kind of nationally and provincially, you'll actually see that in the past year or so, we've actually started seeing the population who are older than 65 starting to outnumber the population that's younger than 15. And we know that this will only continue in future so that by 20 years from now, one in four Canadians will actually be 65 or better. Okay, so we'll go to the next slide. So when you look at the city of Toronto, and this is data from the city of Toronto, and many of you on the call know, and it's good to see that we've got some folks from our neighboring lens as well um, on the call, but you'll know that Toronto, the city of Toronto is actually shared by five different lens. Toronto Central will be literally in the center um, of the map of the city of Toronto, but we also share this ter territory, if you will, with the mississauga halton Lynn, Central West, um, Central Lynn, and Central East Lynn as well. And so this is data that touches everybody in the city of Toronto, but you can see between 2001 and 2011, the population significantly increased by about 22%, and we know the population will continue to grow. We'll go to the next slide as well. So we also know that this is the projections that we have, again, for the city of Toronto, so encompasses these five lens or parts of uh, four of the other lens and Toronto Central. But you'll actually see that, again, the overall population is going to grow in numbers, almost doubling, if you will, uh, from 680,000 to 1.2 million. But you'll also see that uh, when you look at those um, smaller slivers at the top, if you will, imagine going from 2% of our population being 85 and older to 5%. That's, 
that's you know almost you know that's almost a doubling or a hundred percent plus growth um, in these small groups. So that's explosive growth happening in the population. Whereas the fifty-five to sixty-four um, year group and even the sixty-five to seventy-four percent group is going to stay rather constant. So we are going to be aging, but we're going to significantly see a growth, especially in that seventy-five and eighty-five plus population over the next twenty years or thirty years as well. So we'll go to the next slide. And so the other thing that we have to account for is, as many of us are, are realizing, is that older Torontonians have diverse needs. And these are just some of the stats that we, that we share at the city. So for example, we know that over 114,000 families um, have at least one member who's 65 or older, and these are low-income families. And we know that this increases the risk of elder abuse. Some of you may have been at Toronto Public Health's uh, Elder Abuse Forum, the first one they've ever held today at the North York Civic Centre. Um, and this was certainly a topic that we were discussing quite actively. We also know that 54%, 54 so almost half of our, or just over half of older adults, have an active activity limitation or disability. So a challenge in one of their ADLs or IADLs. And the question is how aware and sensitive are we to these needs as well? Another interesting fact is that 37% of adults 55 years or older speak a non-official language. Um, and there are a number of older adults who don't even speak either English or French, for example. So the key is how will, we, how will this influence our ability to communicate effectively with people in their preferred language of choice? And as many as you know, as people uh, may struggle with dementia, they may actually start regress so that they don't learn, say, lang languages, or they can no longer speak languages like English or French um, as, they, um, as their dementia progresses. And they may revert, if you will, back to their original language. Then the final point here is that we know that dementia is a common issue amongst older uh, populations, and that 10% of those who are 65 or older have dementia. But we know that as we age, there's a greater prevalence of this as well. Okay, we'll advance to the next slide. Okay. So again, we always will have pictures and, and thoughts of patients in our mind um, or clients that will serve, you know, who remind us of maybe some of the struggles with aging. Um, and this is a, a, a patient who I've told his story quite a bit over time, but this is a person I met two weeks into my practice of geriatric medicine in Toronto back in 2010. And again, we all have patients who've kind of left indelible memories in our, in our minds, but this was a gentleman I met at the age of 100 years of age. He's a person who was actually quite mobile and able up until the age of 99, but then his CHF, his COPD, his arthritis, all of those things started to catch up with him. He was one of the lucky people who at the age of 100 wasn't living with dementia. You can see that by the Rubik's Cubes on the windowsill there. But you can actually see that, you know, here is an individual who's certainly struggling a lot, um, as you can imagine, by the age of 99, when his arthritis and his CHF, all these things started to conspire against him. So he basically became homebound and he couldn't no longer get down to the grocery store in the basement of his building or the pharmacy to regularly pick up his medications. And certainly he couldn't get out of his home, his apartment building to go and see family doctors, for example. So all of a sudden he started to become cut off to the world. And for him, he could only access care when it was an emergency and he would then call 911 and go to one of the hospitals. In fact, in 2010, by the time I met him in September, he was already on his seventh hospitalization of the year for another CHF exacerbation or a case of pneumonia. And this was a real challenge because here is an older person who certainly wanted to stay independent and active in his own home, but was now struggling to actually meet his needs. And certainly, I know many of you starting to hear this story could start thinking about what are ways in which we could wrap care around this person in a way that could not only deliver better patient outcomes, but also better system outcomes as well. So we'll go to the next slide now. So we obviously have an opportunity to enhance the care of seniors living in Toronto Central Inn through connecting the many seniors focused initiatives as part of one cohesive plan with one common goal. 
all of these activities that you actually see that are actually being um, um, being operated, for example, like our palliative care supports, our caregiver supports, um, our, uh, our dementia strategy supports, transportation, social congregate dining, but also services provided in our hospitals um, and by geriatricians, geriatric psychiatrists and others. These are all actually funded mostly through the Ministry of Health and by the Toronto Central Inn. And certainly the services that the RGP has traditionally been funding also get funded through the Toronto Central Inn. So obviously we've got a, a number of different services that are being provided. And the question is, often we often remark as providers that maybe if they were a little bit better coordinated, uh, especially when we have a wealth of services, we might be able to do more to support our older um, uh, people across Toronto and across Toronto Central Inn. We'll go to the next slide. And this just gives you a, a snapshot, again, of how much money we're actually spending when you actually look at um, services specifically for, um, for seniors in the, uh, in the Toronto Central Inn. It's almost $200 million. So you'll see that the services, for example, that have been provided, um, you know, traditional RGP services are about $10 million. Assess and Restore, some of you are familiar with, was a recent provincial initiative. Um, that really focuses on rehabilitation and reablement. That's over a million dollars. Our investments in BSO are about over 5.2 million. Our home and community care services that are now provided by the TC Lynn is over a hundred million dollars. Our CNAP network, these are 28 community support service agencies. You'll be familiar with some of the larger ones like Wood Green, Sprint, um, West Neighborhood House, Reconnect. All of these are what we call um, um, uh, community support service agencies, and they certainly work not only within um, the Toronto Central Inn, but even across those boundaries. Um, and again, there's also other services that are being provided specifically through the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto, et cetera. But altogether, all of these services we're providing for seniors, and this doesn't even include the services we're providing by our hospitals, total, well, really over $200 million um, in these services as well. And you can see that uh, there's a lot of opportunity here to use these investments perhaps a bit more strategically in a coordinated way to get the best outcomes for um, our older people across the Toronto Central Inn. We'll go to the next slide. So what we've, uh, so through my role um, with the Toronto Central Inn, I've been asked to start working on developing a seniors plan. And I wanna really just emphasize here that you'll hear a lot of the language that I'm used is, you know, we're proposing something, we're trying to test these ideas. And you'll see that today's, this is not a fait accompli. This is something that has happened uh, through a lot of engagement already with our, uh, with a lot of the other clinical leads, our primary care leads um, and other leads across uh, the Toronto Central Inn. We have a mental health lead um, and a variety of clinical leads as well. And we've also started engaging um, with different stakeholder groups um, around that. And we were really grateful that the RGP network um, would allow us to use this webinar so that we could again spread the word on the work we're doing as we try and get feedback um, on what we're proposing here as well. So there really is an opportunity to provide feedback and we really would like you to think about that as you hear what I'm about to talk about. And really we're trying to create a regional seniors plan that's really built around four themed pillars. And what we've heard so far is that these are the four areas that we really wanna make sure we're focusing on. So how do we enhance active aging, wellness and prevention, for example? What are the things we can do? And certainly you can think about a variety of things that we could do uh, really from a preventative approach um, that we know is significantly important in terms of enhancing the overall quality of life for older, older adults. We also want to make sure that we can enhance and integrate services that support seniors in their community. And you can imagine that can include both services that are, you know, community-based services or social services, but also health services as well. Often we're hearing from our primary care and other colleagues and from those in the community sector that it really is sometimes really challenging to access specialist services for seniors, but specialist services in general. So how do we make sure that we have a key focus in the next year about streamlining, improving timely access to specialist services? And then finally, how do we think about dementia? And why specifically dementia? Because it's a significant issue that it really does affect a number of older people. Um, and this is why we wanna focus on dementia, awareness, prevention, support, and care for both clients and caregivers. We'll go to the next slide. 
So to give you a sense of um, what we're thinking around each of these pillars here, um, well, these are just some of the ideas that we have in terms of thinking about strategic goals, for example. So you're going to see strategic goals and you're going to see some of the proposed plan work that we have for 1819. So first of all, one of our goals is we want to make sure that more seniors are able to access health and non-health services, education tools and resources more easily in, within their communities. So we're certainly looking at how do we actually make these services and resources more easily accessible. So for example, we fund across the province 2,000 free exercise and falls prevention classes, and we have a number of these actually operating across Toronto Central Lynn and across our, our neighboring lens as well. And my question to you is, do you know with confidence that if you had a senior in your presence and you thought they should go to one of these free exercise and falls prevention classes, could you easily locate the closest one to them? I can't. So if you can, you're doing something magical. But the key is we need to make information like this super accessible. Do you feel confident that if you have a senior in your presence from somewhere in Toronto Central Inn, you can tell them exactly who their local Meals on Wheels provider should be? So how do we get this information to them um, and let them know how they can actually access that service more easily? The next aspect we focus on is how do we support people with preventative health services like the free vaccinations that are available, but also those exercise of false prevention programs. So for example, right now we know that our vaccination rates for things like pneumonia and, shing, um, pneumonia and um, flu in particular are quite abysmal. The Public Health Agency of Canada wants us to make sure 80% of our seniors are vaccinated, but right now influenza is in the 60s and pneumonia is actually in the 30s right now. And actually this year, for example, the high dose flu vaccine is gonna be available uh, for seniors, but not through pharmacies. How do we make sure people get access to these things that are fun fully funded and publicly available, especially when we know that flu significantly increases the risk, flu and pneumonia, of being hospitalized and actually potentially dying. We also wanna make sure that we can figure out how we can better support people um, uh, who may be experiencing social isolation. And that's making sure people know that in Toronto, the city of Toronto, we are actually opening eight new senior centers um, over the next fiscal year. Do you know where those eight senior centers, those new ones, in addition to the other ones we run will be? And do you know how to get your older adults connected with those? So some of the things that we've, we're, we wanna focus on, for example, is making sure that we can actually work with our partners to increase vaccination rates, increase engagement with those seniors active living centers, that's what the SALC acronym is, those exercise classes and services like Toronto Ride, which last year provided um, over, um, a, a, at least over 100,000 rides, but we wanna make sure that we can get more people accessing those services that would be useful for them. We want to improve our information referral systems and the Toronto Central Lynn is looking at some of the best practice from our other LINs around the province to see how we can make information more easily accessible through the telephone or through web-based formats. And we also want to refine our local asset maps so that we can uh, support better matching of demands with services and better leverage technology to support self-navigation. So these are some of the ideas we have. But certainly as you think about this pillar, if you have other ideas that you want us to consider, I'd love you to email me and I'd love you to share with me your thoughts as well because we're just in the phase right now of consultation and certainly we wanna make sure that we understand what could we accomplish in this next year and certainly what could we accomplish in the future. We'll go to the next slide. The next uh, pillar of our plan is really thinking about that integrating services that support seniors in their communities. And again, we wanna make sure that we have more consistent standards and levels of care being provided and made available across all, uh, all care settings. So again, what do we expect? What are the standards that we, that we will adhere to um, and to make sure that we can hold ourselves more accountable? We wanna make sure that more home care services can be provided interprofessionally in a more neighborhood and population-based way. So one of the things that the Toronto Central Lynn has been experimenting and the former TC, the Toronto Central CCAC has been experimenting was this idea of a neighborhood care teams. Because when we've been looking at, for example, a Toronto community housing building on Young Street, we find that we have maybe 50 clients there receiving home care, but from a total of 20 different agencies, Maybe we should just have one group of agencies working in that building who can actually just organize the services because it'll make it much easier for the clients and much easier for all the different 
hardworking service provider organizations to provide care in a more coordinated way. And there are ways that we can try and test that. And that's certainly something that Toronto Central Lynn is trying to organize. And also making sure that our future care coordinators can work at a more neighborhood level, as opposed to maybe having to run and crisscross the city to take care of a variable caseload. We also want to make sure, for example, that our Toronto Central Lynn funded care can better reflect the needs of current and future residents. Are there certain individuals or populations that are being neglected because they may not fit the traditional referral pathways? So we certainly want to establish some common standards for, say, geriatric medicine services, adult day programs, and other services for implementation in 1920. And certainly, those of you who are involved in the work of the RGP know that they are certainly doing some of this work already to try and help start that conversation. We also want to make sure that we can support the Toronto Central Lynn's Home and Community Care Division in the creation of a functional neighborhood care team delivery model. And we also want to make sure with the new LTC investments, over a thousand new long-term care beds are going to be built in Toronto Central. But we want to make sure that as we're building these brand new bricks and mortar facilities, that they can also be leveraged in ways that, for example, may also co-locate a future adult day program or maybe a future seniors active living center. So how can it actually meet the needs of current and future residents? Okay. The next thing we'll do is we'll go to the next slide and we'll look at the third one. So how do we actually address that aspect of access to specialist services for seniors? And when some of you think about specialist services, you might think of just geriatricians and geriatric services. But so far, we've been asked to just broaden our mind a little bit more broadly, because many of you might be involved with a number of the different kind of services that exist, for example. So for example, within the field of primary care, we actually have a number of uh, uh, groups that are providing home-based primary care. And so one of the things we wanna do is, is work on developing a more coherent home-based primary care strategy. There are a number of other specialized programs, like for example, Scope, Spin, and Tip, which are really meant to support our solo family doctors, for example, who may have complex older patients and have trouble getting them into uh, various services because they're not working as part of an interprofessional team. Some of you will be familiar with our telemedicine interprofessional clinics, which are interprofessional clinics that serve high-risk, high-needs populations. Um, for example, our geriatric medicine and geriatric psychiatry clinics that we run through this way. And so how do we make sure that we access those services? But then how do we also make sure that we have you know, an aligned group of geriatric medicine clinics, um, outreach services, you know, that, uh, that and, 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 and geriatric psychiatry services that make it easy for folks to be able to access and navigate as well. And then we also want to make sure that this work is aligned with our dementia plan to improve access to care and supports. We'll go to the next slide. And then finally, when we talk about advancing dementia awareness, prevention, support, and care, there's work that's already going on on developing a Toronto Central Lynn Dementia Plan. This is not the dementia plan that I'm speaking to today, but I want to allude to that so you're aware of that work that's actually happening. Um, and that work is actually being um, led um, in the Lynn um, specifically through um, Baycrest and Woodgreen um, and uh, groups like our TAS and Dementia Research Alliance and the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto. There's a whole separate uh, piece of work that's actually happening, but I'll just give you a window in this because we want to make sure that if we're working on a seniors plan, that it also is well connected to our dementia plan. And certainly we have some dementia um, um, uh, investments that are occurring this year across the TC Lynn. That's the investments in expanded caregiver support programs being run through the Reitman Center. That's actually going to be reaching across the province, but also um, here in partnership with the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto. But we also have the Alzheimer's Society of Toronto has received additional funding this year to actually help uh, expand the number of first link care navigators. So we want to make sure that we're making sure that those investments on top of the previous year's investments around expanding the, the behavioral support outreach uh, initiatives and other things can all be aligned so that, again, these can be seen as specialist services and supports that can really help patients um, or older adults and, uh, and family members living with dementia as well. So again, our goals here are that we want to make sure that more seniors with dementia will get timely access, diagnosis, management, and treatment. We also want to make sure that community-dwelling seniors with dementia and behavioral issues can access community-based uh, support services in a timely way. And we want to make sure that more caregivers of seniors with dementia 
will get access to those TC LIN funded supports and services as well. Because we certainly do have a number of caregiver supports that are being provided, like respite hours, like respite beds, um, and also caregiver grants as well. So we need to make sure that we're supporting our caregivers as well. And so we'll go to the next slide. Um, and this is just some of the examples of some of the proposed metrics. So right now we know that we're doing a lot of good work, but sometimes it's just unbeknownst to us, for example, how, how that work is actually being accomplished and measured in a good way. And certainly um, Susan Fitzpatrick, the CEO of, of, our, um, of our LIN here in Toronto Central, is really keen that no matter what we're doing, every plan that the LIN puts forward has some clear accountability metrics that are being associated. So those of you who are familiar with the report I wrote in 2012 for the ministry, Living Longer, Living Well, we'll see that in the back of that report, there was a whole bunch of proposed metrics. These are metrics based on what we know we could actually measure with existing data that we're actually all collecting. Um, and so there, those were proposed metrics that we actually had in the back of that. And what we did was we built on that work um, and actually looked at what are things that we could do to measure under, um, measure under these four pillars that might help tell us if we're actually advancing some of those goals in a meaningful way. So for example, you know, looking at the percentage of seniors receiving influenza pneumococcal vaccination. Um, how many ED visits are we actually having in Toronto Central Inn um, due to falls? And then as a balancing metric, how many people are actually participating in those free exercise and falls prevention programs? If we're getting more people into those programs, we should probably see, be seeing less falls. We also have valuable services run by community support services sectors. So in Toronto Central, Sprint Senior Care coordinates amongst the CNAP agencies a program called Toronto Ride. These are subsidized community transport options for people who don't need wheel-trans and who can't drive themselves or don't feel comfortable taking TTC. This is an excellent option that's available and is subsidized by the ministry. Maybe we should know all how many people are taking this and maybe set ourselves a target that we can get more people informed about this because I know certainly a number of the patients I encounter had no clue the service exists. So how do we make sure that more people know about these things? We also know that uh, when, we're, when we have older adults in hospital or when they're being discharged back to the community, that's a really high risk of a time for readmission. So we can look at things like 30-day readmission rates because we have that data. And maybe if we see what we could do to focus our activities in that way, we could actually support people better. And we want to make sure that we're looking at primary care, home-based primary care. And part of our home-based primary care strategy is looking at how many TC LINs are providing and how many seniors are actually receiving longitudinal home-based primary care. Because we certainly have a lot of work ahead of us to encourage more doctors to be doing and, and more primary care providers in general to be providing um, home-based visits. Um, and there's, uh, there's a lot of excitement on growing this activity, but we need to have some metrics behind that. We're also looking, for example, at, at how many um, seniors are being seen by our TC Lynn geriatricians and geriatric psychiatrists. And certainly one thing that we are very conscious, conscientious about is that many of the TC Lynn providers might be providing care to people from neighboring Lynn's. There's nothing wrong with that, but we wanna make sure that we understand you know, are we meeting the needs of the seniors in our LIN? But then also, how are we also best supporting other LINs who may not have access to the same specialist services that we do um, when we may have a higher proportion uh, of folks as well? And so the TC LIN is making sure that if we do move forward with this metric, for example, we make it really easy for geriatric medicine and psychiatry clinics to basically be able to help determine very quickly, you know, if their client might happen to be from the TC LIN or outside the TC LIN. We also want to look at how many folks are coming into our emergency departments uh, with dementia, for example, or being hospitalized, because certainly this can also help us understand how well our community behavioral support uh, are working and perhaps how effective they are at helping prevent people from ending up um, in the ED with dementia as well. And again, how do we also focus on things like um, how we're supporting our, our primary caregivers, for example, who may be experiencing feelings of distress and being able to continue in their caring activities. 
This was an example of a really powerful metric we used at the provincial level that helped show us that this actual number was climbing significantly despite more investments in home and community care. And this helped compel the ministry about two years ago to specifically start targeting funding towards the LINs specifically to better support caregivers um, of home care clients so that we could make sure that we were better supporting those needs. And that's one metric that we get, for example, that comes out of the home care uh, interi assessments um, and a way that we can actually measure and take one window look at how our caregivers are feeling. So these are just some examples of how we want to make sure that we can feel more accountable for the work that we're doing and we can measure this as well um, uh, as well so i just see some questions that are coming in here some comments for example um, and i know that uh, a number have come through so what we might actually do is i might have wendy and caitlin who might be able to kind of see things that have scrolled through so that we can address them because i think there's some really really good conversations here um, I see one question, for example, saying, will you be looking at North York General for readmissions to a hospital or Scarborough Hospital? The TC Lynn boundaries will not cover people um, straddling Lynn borders. And that's, that's exactly the point here. I'm the seniors lead for Toronto Central Lynn. I, I can't speak on behalf of the, of the, of the, of the, the hospitals and the, um, and the work of the other Lynns as well. What we're hoping is that certainly this is the approach the TC Lynn is taking. Um, and, uh, and we know that a number of other Lynns actually have a seniors lead as well. And so hopefully this work, um, if it resonates with the other Lynns, they'll want to look at this as well, because certainly this is data that really speaks to the fact that in the GTA where we have five Lynns, we have a certainly uh, a number of folks as well. And I think someone said, for example, yes, North York General is in the central Lynn, not the TC Lynn, but certainly, you know, a number of uh, folks um, who live in Toronto Central will access North York General Hospital, and a number of North uh, people who live in Central Lynn do access Toronto Central Lynn services. So this speaks to a little bit of the fact that our borders are not um, uh, tight, if you will, and that we have people uh, expanding across. Um, we'll go to the next slide here. Um, so really, this is our time to lead, and we've got many great opportunities in terms of how we can better support folks. Um, and uh, and and this is this is just the starting point of kind of the conversation that we're having. I think our next slide. I hope it's showing a little bit of our timelines here. We can take a peek ahead. Absolutely, this is the one here. So this just shows you a little bit of our next steps. As I told you, what we're re what we're doing right now is in, in early September. We're really um, engaging with some of our partners and stakeholders to start ref refining focus and issue scopes and, and, and that. Um, and we started confirming. So I just went to the Toronto Central Lynn Board um, just the other day on Wednesday to present, you know, our initial uh, plan, and they gave me permission now to start taking this on the road. So that's why I'm very grateful for the. RGP um, to certainly be willing to host this webinar today, just really hot off the press of what I've shown to the board. But again, I want to repeat that this work here um, is going to, um, we're looking for feedback over the next uh, month or so, so that we can really hear, are we getting the messages right? And as you'll see here, our, our work plan, um, our CEO, um, Susan Fitzpatrick has said, I don't really want to know what you want to do. Well, she does, but over year two and year three, I want you to tell me what you will be able to help start accomplishing in the next year, certainly with a longer term goal. So if there are other ideas that you have, we'd love to hear them. Um, and we certainly have about 20 minutes now for questions and answers um, uh, as well. I like the comment that I just saw saying there are over 900 indicators being collected in the acute care sector. Hope we reduce the useless ones in future. I certainly am only looking at about three or four um, that, uh, that are actually what I think are meaningful um, and, uh, and hopefully you would as well. So Caitlin and Wendy, I'm gonna pass it over to you um, to help start to moderate our conversation. Great, thank you, Dr. Sinha. I could see that there were lots of great suggestions uh, by the attendees in the chat box, and I just wanted to assure everyone that these are being uh, recorded and will be shared with Dr. Sinha as well for consideration in the plans. Um, some very interesting information, thank you very much. And I'll, I'll start off with maybe a question that I think a lot of folks might have, and that's you spoke about the current funding that goes into seniors care, and there's, there's a lot of funding being put into that right now. And I'm wondering if there are additional funds being provided by the LIN to move this specific plan forward. 
Well, I think right now we don't have any, um, there's no, if you will, there's no new funding um, that's been announced by the current government. Right now, the new government that's come into place has confirmed, for example, that the dementia strategy investments um, that have been made are confirmed. Um, and, uh, and the new seniors active living centers that are going to be open this year, um, that funding is confirmed. But some of folks will know about things like NORCs, for example, or some of these other funding ideas that were announced before the prior election. Um, that funding hasn't certainly been ruled on officially by the ministry yet. Um, but I'm not necessarily thinking, we haven't heard of there any new um, um, funding that's coming through. So right now the LIN is trying to look at what can we practically do within our existing resources, especially when um, we do have quite a lot of funding that's going to projects, but certainly things that we can do. So we've really tried to look at what is it that is within our scope? What can we do right now? Um, and certainly there's a lot of quick wins that we think we can earn um, by, um, by working within existing resources at the moment. We are hoping though certainly that this work may, may help identify opportunities for either reallocation or investments um, and, um, and certainly uh, we'll be open to that and certainly speaking to the ministry um, about those opportunities that we start to identify. Great, thank you for that clarification. And I see uh, Marlena Wad from the RGP of Toronto uh, is just mentioning as well that the RGP's investment of 10 million that you'd mentioned for, um, sorry, my uh, chat box just moved there, is yeah. just a portion of what, uh, what hospitals are, are receiving. Absolutely, and I think that's one of the things that we've identified over the past, uh, you know, the past year, for example, that, you know, we have, um, you know, 10 million in RGP investments that are being coordinated through a select group of hospitals, you know, that are providing some really good services. But we certainly have had over the last, you know, number of years, a number of other hospitals that, uh, or those hospitals, for example, that have certainly leveraged far more than the $10 million in those existing, if you will, RGP funded hospitals. But then other hospitals, for example, like Sinai um, and Women's College and Toronto East General, for example, uh, amongst many others, um, that have significantly made investments of their own as well. So the key is that one of the goals that we want to do is, as the TC Lin is the funder for all of these services, including the RGP services now, we want to have a, a conversation with our hospitals to say, we recognize that you um, are getting a variety of sources of funding, and we want to see how we can help have you better commit overall your support um, to moving forward seniors plans goals. And we've really seen a really nice response from the hospitals wanting to have that level of conversation as well and wanting to understand what is it that we expect of them and how do we expect them regardless of whatever historical funding has been to be a part of the plan. And we expect that certainly um, the RGP um, is gonna help us um, you know, with that dialogue from its great experience over the last number of years. Wonderful. I see lots of great questions coming in here in the chat box and I encourage everyone to keep uh, typing in their questions and, and we'll go through them as we can here. So there's another one that's asking, will there be a qualitative uh, component to evaluation and measurement indicators? That's a great question from Francis uh, Morton Chang. Um, and what we wanted to do is, uh, is, you know, certainly when we think about how we could do a rigorous evaluation, absolutely qualitative um, and other kind of new indicators would be great. What we don't want is, I think someone had mentioned earlier, there's over six or 700 indicators being asked of the acute care sector. What we want to start for this year, our inaugural year, um, because again, a lot of those basic indicators that we talked about aren't being routine routinely necessarily, you know, um, reported, if you will. So what we wanted to do was Matt Morgan, who's our vice president, uh, Dr. Morgan, who's our vice president of clinical, um, uh, wanted us to really choose metrics that we know are pretty much already being collected or easily collectible. Because what we want to do is certainly within our, our, our senior sectors, we want to get people collecting data that's easy to collect, that it might be data that they're already routinely collecting. And we want to make sure we make it um, make it easy to be involved in something that can report back. I think in future, 
um, certainly, you know, trying to do qualitative analyses would be absolutely useful. And we need to figure out ways we can move that forward. But for this year, we're looking at things that are already being collected or easily measurable that can give us a really good window on what seniors, um, if you will, care looks like. Um, and then how do we move that forward from there? Great. Um, here's a comment from Dr. Camilla Wong uh, suggesting it would be great to have a way to ensure physicians are getting reports back from frontline providers once Lynn referrals have been sent. And as she mentions, it's sometimes uh, difficult to get this information and it would be great to have just a spot on a referral form so MDs can request uh, getting a report back so they can, you know, continue to stay in that circle of care and be informed about uh, the care that's been delivered. No, absolutely. And I think that's, again, something that I share that kind of desire as well. Um, right now, in terms of, um, you know, specifically, like, how do we make sure that when the TC Lynn contracts a service out, you know, to a, a provider um, agency, that that agency, you know, is compelled that if, if, for example, if Dr. Wong is ordering a specific test and requests, you know, to receive a report, that that report will be received. It's too difficult to receive that information. And part of that work, if you will, around neighborhood care teams and actually trying to reduce the number of um, uh, maybe of different providers, maybe working with one client, for example, can allow a much better alignment of, um, of communication from the prescribing provider to um, also receiving information back. So that is certainly something that I've been advocating for more strongly. And I think there's a lot of just different moving parts towards trying to achieve that as well. Absolutely. And our audience comments are agreeing with that too. There's lots to gain by better integrating and organizing what we've got out there, right? Uh, so there's another um, question here. Will we ever see an Ontario uh, on lock like program of all inclusive care for the elderly PACE comprehensive community based seniors program at a Lynn or sub Lynn regional jurisdiction? So I'm absolutely determined to actually see that happen. Um, for those of you who don't know what unlock or pace is, it's kind of what I'm, I'm dubbing kind of as virtual long-term care. So certainly um, I just met with the Premier's office the, uh, just the other day um, where we were having this conversation because um, some of you may have seen the editorial I put in the star right before the final election where I, I, I invited each of the three political parties that was pitching building 30,000 new long-term care beds, um, the opportunity to um, I was giving them permission to say that uh, they weren't going to keep that promise, if you will, because what I've been trying to pitch, and I know a number of my colleagues have been pit, uh, have been pitching, is that often, you know, if we allow our community support service agencies and home care providers more flexibility, especially for people who might be eligible for long-term care, mm -hmm. PACE is a great example where that's an offering um, that's available in the United States in a number of different states where folks who are both long-term care eligible um, and older than 65 could have this alternative where an agency could be given the flexibility to provide care in very flexible ways um, so that you wouldn't actually have to go into a long-term care home. And for those of you who are interested, Care First Services for Seniors, one of the community support services agencies um, in the greater Toronto area, more so in the you know, Richmond Hill, Scarborough area, has actually been developing their own version of PACE right now. But certainly one of my pitches to government has been, instead of building 30,000 new bricks and mortar beds, maybe we could actually take half of the funding and actually make more PACE-like models available in Ontario. And there's actually a lot of work, I have to say, going on behind the scenes in the ministry to really look at that idea. And there's actually a lot of positive receptivity. So I'm hoping, you know, in my continued role with the Ontario government, we'll be looking at some of these things provincially, but certainly they are, they are looking towards the fact that you know, our Lynn amongst others is, is, is also showing how we want to do some more work like the seniors plan on the ground um, that can help uh, measure and, uh, um, and look at how we can move forward. And it sounds like our attendees have, uh, are giving their support for, for change as well. Ellen Katz says, so change the configuration, our seniors deserve it. And Francis Morton Chang is saying great model, but difficult to implement a PACE or unlock model under current system configs. Uh, seniors Care has built something close to this model as has another province in Peel region. So she's glad to hear this. And others are chiming in. They totally agree. Time for change, right? Absolutely. Well, again, we've changed our government. So uh, maybe this is change that will occur now. 
Well, and with the plans that you have outlined that you have in place, it sounds like some great changes is on its way. Um, there was a question, will ECHO be part of the strategy? Yeah, so if, if some of the folks may not be aware of what ECHO is, um, this was a, a, a ministerial funded initiative um, to really help build capacity amongst, if you will, primary care providers and others, um, you know, from experts. And I believe, if I'm correct, um, Baycrest is our lead partner doing the Geriatrics ECHO program, where they're inviting in primary care providers um, in, you know, with family health teams and other groups across the province to participate in a series of lectures and kind of capacity building um, sessions. Ah, thank you very much, Valerie. It's Baycrest and um, Northeast um, Specialized Geriatric Services um, uh, for the northern portion, but I think collectively these are the two partnering groups that are working on behalf of the ministry to help deliver this program. Um, and so um, certainly that's a program that's being run, I believe, via the ministry with those groups. Um, and so I, do, I don't necessarily have any um, oversight of the Toronto Central. Lynn doesn't have oversight over the ECHO initiative. But this is, um, this is another example of some of the great work that we should make sure stays connected as we think about building, um, building uh, um, uh, capacity within the system and how do we align that as well. Great. Uh, there's a comment here from Jem. Will there be more mobile geriatric support from geriatric patients that are for geriatric patients that are homeless and in the community? I think these are, again, these are some great ideas that right now we don't actually have any new funding available that we know of. Um, there might be you know, new funding announcements that come out um, later this year, for example. So right now, for example, um, you know, if there is, you know, an organization that wants to do that and can do that within existing resources, you know, the Lynn really wants to see that any work that people want to do to move, move this plan forward would be great and would be welcome. Um, I think right now, um, as we start thinking about what else do we need, say, in Toronto Central to move the work forward, such as, you know, more mobile services, especially that can work with, um, with, um, with more homeless or underhoused seniors. I think that's a great idea. And if we can start thinking about what that would look like, what would the investment take, there may be an opportunity in future if new funds arise uh, for us to look at those models as well. So I think these are some of the things that we should um, be open-minded to that what I've been talking about is not, is not the only things that move forward. There's lots of different people and organizations who are doing great work to advance this. Um, and I think great ideas need to be supported and certainly um, and hopefully supported provincially as well. What I would suggest maybe at this point, Caitlin, is we do have two other poll questions. Maybe we can do those two poll questions now. And then, um, and then uh, as you being the chair, you and Wendy being the chairs, um, you can decide after the polls whether or not we have a chance for one last question, which you can pose as well. So the first one is, uh, which is the most important pillar of work in the proposed Toronto Central Lens Seniors in Dementia Plan? Um, so again, those four pillars, again, are enhancing active aging, wellness, and prevention. Number two, it's enhancing integrated services to support seniors in their communities. Number three, it's streamlining and improving timely access to specialist services for seniors. And number four, it's advancing dementia awareness, prevention, support, and care for both clients and caregivers. So please take a moment to determine which, which one do you think is the most important uh, for you. This will be very helpful as we consider our work moving forward. Okay, I think time's gonna be up very shortly. What do we have here? Okay, so really neat. Okay, so um, it seems like there's support across all four areas, but the two that seem to get the most uh, support is over 56% really want to enhance and integrating services support seniors in their communities. Um, and number four, which was the advancing dementia awareness. So that's great, and that's great feedback, and I appreciate especially from my believe over 100 people on the webinar today. Okay, we'll go to our next poll question then. 
And it's basically, it's really simple. You know, using, um, using metrics can help us stay on track, accountable, and achieve our goals. We haven't really done this before with many of our plans, but I'm hoping, I've been really keen on seeing that we start having metrics that, again, we can look together as system partners to see, is this moving this in the right direction or not? So I just want to make sure that people actually think that it's a good idea to have metrics and it's a good idea to hold accountable. I know the Premier's office and the Ministry are very keen that we start becoming more accountable with our dollars moving forward. So really, it's just a simple yes or no. Okay, good. 98% say yes. Okay, so we're on the right track. I'm sure the Premier will be happy to hear that as well. Okay, so um, with that being said, Wendy and Caitlin are uh, the ringmasters here. So they can let us know whether we get one last question in uh, or not, or how they want to proceed for the last four minutes of our webinar today. Okay, great. Uh, I don't see any other questions uh, in the chat box at this time, so I think we'll wrap questions now, but we'd like to encourage attendees to send all of their ideas and thoughts in addition to what they've already uh, put in the chat box directly to, to Dr. Sinha as he's requested. And we want to thank you very much, Dr. Sinha, for sharing these exciting plans with us that are underway to better support older adults. It sounds like some great changes underway. Thank you too to the audience for your attendance. We encourage you to take a few minutes to complete the quick survey. The 98% uh, of you that enjoy um, metrics will, uh, will be pleased to fill out the survey, I'm sure. <laughs> this will be emailed to you. We'd also like to invite you to attend our upcoming webinar on October 26 on home and community care experience surveys. And this presentation will focus on the development of two surveys that reflect on what is meaningful to clients and caregivers who are receiving care through lynn based home and community care. So this will also be a very interesting webinar coming up at the end of October. Registration information will be emailed soon as well. And with that, uh, we'd like to wrap up, and I echo the sentiments of the attendees that are coming through in the chat box. Thank you very much, Dr. Sinha. We appreciate your time. Thanks again, audience, and we'll see you next time. Signing off now.